Hello, this is Domenico Composto with Easynomics, and today we're going to graph and analyze a monopoly market structure, uh, as you would on an IB exam for paper one. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, go over the characteristics of this market structure. Uh, we assume in this market structure that we're dealing with a single or dominant large firm within the industry. Um, if there's a single firm producing a good or service for the entire market, it is called a pure monopoly, and thus the firm is the industry. Or if a firm controls about 80% of the market, it's also considered a monopoly. So you could have a remaining 20% um, controlled by smaller firms, but you have one dominant firm that has about 80% of the market share. An example of that, around 2000, De Beers Company of South Africa controlled about 80% of diamond sales. So effectively, it is a monopoly. In addition, with uh, this market structure, the monopoly, since they are the dominant firm, they have significant control over price, thus making them a price maker. And they face a downward sloping demand curve, but, be, but they don't face uh, competition, so their PED is fairly inelastic which provides them the ability to raise price to increase total revenue. So they have incredible market power. In addition, some other characteristics of monopolies that they produce and sell a unique product with no close substitutes. Some examples being electrical companies where they operate as the single or only supplier for a particular city or state or even for a nation. Uh, water companies as well. Uh, one dominant uh, water company uh, that provides for the entire city or for a state or for uh, a country. Um, and then we'll get in another video, I'll talk about this in terms of these companies, electrical and water, being natural monopolies. And we'll, I'll explain that in the next video. Uh, other examples, uh, maybe petroleum extracting firms, um, they control a unique product. There's no close substitute for petroleum in our industrial economy. Uh, our economy, unfortunately, is very dependent on petroleum for the transportation of goods and services and people, transportation of inputs, etc. And uh, other examples of companies that are rising as a monopoly, Amazon in terms of e-commerce. And uh, there's more and more talk today about Amazon being a uh, significant monopoly and acquiring more and more market power. Uh, there was a, an article a few years ago from The Atlantic when Amazon bought Whole Foods and uh, beginning this discussion of uh, its market power and whether or not it's becoming a significant monopoly. Um, in addition, if you look at Amazon on Wikipedia, uh, it highlights that it's one of the big four dominant U.S. companies in terms of information technology, along with Google, Apple, and Facebook. Um, and so perhaps in the next decade or so, you might see um, the United States uh, you know, filing antitrust lawsuits against these big four firms and potentially breaking them. But in terms of information technology, uh, Amazon here with Google, Apple, and Facebook uh, that would be an oligopolistic market structure, and I'll talk about that in another video. So going back to uh, the other characteristics, um, also they have very high barriers to entry, uh, thus explaining why there's so few, so few firms in this industry. Um, some of those barriers could include huge economies of scale, uh, could be a strong brand, for example, Coke uh, and Pepsi both have very strong brands. And when Virgin Cola launched in uh, the late 1990s, uh, they had a lot of difficulty getting people to consume their product because of the strength of their competitor, Coke and Pepsi. Other barriers could include legal barriers, um, copyrights, uh, protection of intellectual property that prevents other firms from copying that technology and also uh, control of essential resources, so with the example of petroleum, and also the use of aggressive tactics. Um, and just a quick example of that, you know, if you looked at the history of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company, um, they used very aggressive tactics against smaller petroleum firms, 
but that's another story. Perhaps I'll explain that in another video. So some examples, just some historical examples. Again, uh, Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller, who is uh, considered to be the wealthiest person in history. If we adjusted his wealth for inflation, um, today it would be hovering around 300 300 billion dollars 300 billion dollars and then also another example american tobacco company um and some some other examples de beers as i mentioned google amazon and in another video i'll talk about these natural monopoly examples electrical companies water companies railroad lines telecommunications where it makes sense just that that one firm is providing for the entire market okay so let's go ahead and draw uh, draw this model. Alright, so I'll just make a note that we're going to be uh, working on drawing a monopoly. Oop, uh, I forgot to take this off. Give me one second. Here we go. So here we have monopoly is the market structure that we're looking at. I'll make that even better. Monopoly. Okay. And we're going to look at the market for e-commerce. Market for e-commerce. And the dominant firm that we're looking at is, oops, today is not my day to spell, is Amazon. Okay, so market for e-commerce with Amazon being the dominant firm. Okay, so uh, this is a pretty straightforward economic model. Uh, we measure quantity on the x-axis. We're measuring price, costs, and revenue on the y-axis. And um, as I've stated before in my monopolistic competition graphs, I always start with the supply curve. So we have that backwards J shape where S1 equals marginal cost one. And then we have our average total cost curve sloping down. When it intersects with ATC, then immediately it starts to rise. Call it ATC one. And then we'll draw the demand curve and we're gonna make our demand curve fairly inelastic, fairly steep. So we'll have demand coming down, fairly steep demand curve. D1 equals average revenue, one. And we want to remember that demand is also equal to our marginal benefit. And I've, as I've mentioned that when I draw the demand curve, I draw it above the intersection of MC and ATC. And then they have the MR curve below it. So I'm going to have the marginal revenue curve coming below, going negative. And here we have MR1. So here we have finished drawing a monopoly. Um, let's add some detail. So we're going to assume that the firm is profit maximizing. So profit maximization occurs where MR equals MC, where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. So here is our marginal revenue curve. And here is our marginal cost curve. And they intersect at this point. So the monopolist will increase the quantity supplied until their marginal costs equal their marginal revenue right here. And that will set quantity at Q1. And then they will price according to their demand curve. And their demand curve is right here. So they're going to price according to their demand. And so they're going to set a fairly high price for their good or service at P1. And then there, in terms of the cost, we come down, we see the ATC right here, and there are the costs. So we can see in comparison to the monopolistic competitive graph that we've drawn that the supernormal profit or this green rectangle area is fairly large, which is what we would expect with monopolists since they have the power to really raise price to the fact that they have a very inelastic demand curve. Um, they can raise price and increase total revenue. So this green shaded area is the supernova profit of the monopolist. In this case, Amazon's dominating control of e-commerce. In addition, um, some other things that we can point out, and I'll mention this later in our evaluation. I just want to highlight that it is, oh, let me choose a better color. 
that it is allocatively inefficient. So at the quantity of Q1, we see that the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. So it's allocatively inefficient, but I'll highlight that point uh, when we get to the evaluation. Okay, so there we have quickly drawn a monopoly graph. And now we can analyze it as we would in a paper one. So let's begin. As can be seen, we have a graph illustrating a monopoly. In this case, it's the market for e-commerce. And we're looking at the uh, firm Amazon as being the dominant firm with the biggest market share, perhaps in th hypothetically 80% of the market or more. We can see we have, we're measuring quantity on the x-axis and price costs and revenue on the y-axis. We have an upward sloping supply curve labeled S1, according to the law of supply, which is equal to our marginal cost curve, MC1. And it intersects with the average total cost curve at its lowest point. We also have a downward sloping demand curve labeled D1, which is equal to average revenue one, which is equal to marginal benefit. And we'll notice that the demand curve has a inelastic, um, that the demand curve is inelastic, which provides that the monopolist can increase price to increase their total revenue. We also notice that we have a marginal revenue curve labeled MR1, and the marginal revenue curve is less than the average revenue curve because we're assuming that the firm does not price discriminate. Assuming profit maximization, where the firm produces where MR equals MC, it sets quantity at Q1, and at Q1 they price according to the demand curve at P1, which is equal to the average revenue one. And uh, at Q1 we see that price is greater than cost at the ATC, so P1 is greater than C1, or greater than ATC1, so the firm is generating super normal profit. So that's the analysis. Now we can uh, just highlight two evaluative points. There'll be other points that you would raise in your evaluation when you may be comparing and contrasting one market structure to the other, but the evaluator will always be looking to see if you're gonna be discussing productive and allocative efficiency. So let's first talk about productive efficiency. Productive efficiency, by definition in economics, occurs when you're producing at minimum ATC, okay? And minimum ATC occurs where uh, MC equals ATC, all right? The intersection of the marginal cost curve with ATC provides minimum, and that's at this point right here. But we can see that at quantity one, ATC one is greater than uh, minimum ATC. So the monopolist produces at a quantity of, let's say it's ATC1, greater than minimum ATC. So the monopolist is productively inefficient. Right? It's a productively inefficient firm. And it makes sense. They don't face direct competition. There's no real pressure on the monopolist to keep their costs down. Uh, so we would we would expect some level of productive inefficiency with the monopolist. In addition, uh, let's talk about allocative efficiency. Allocative efficiency occurs. Let's make a note. Allocative efficiency occurs where the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. Where basically demand equals supply. And here we have our marginal cost curve. Here we have our marginal benefit curve. I'll highlight in perhaps another color. I'll use this color. So here's our marginal cost or supply curve. Here's our marginal benefit or demand curve. Where they intersect at this point would be allocatively efficient, but we see that at Q1, the marginal benefit is greater than, than the marginal cost. So at Q1, we notice that the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. So the monopolist is under allocating. There's an under allocation right, of resources to the production um, and consumption of the e-commerce uh, e goods and services that are desired by society. All right, so that's basically it. We have drawn a monopolist. 
we have analyzed it as we would on a paper one, and I've just highlighted the evaluative points of productive and allocative efficiency. And that's it. Thank you so much. And um, if you can, please subscribe, like, and comment. Thank you so much.